Welcome. Thank you so much for being our guest participant this afternoon. My name is Miriam Klein Kasanoff, and I'm the founder of the film series Screening the Holocaust in partnership with the Miami Jewish Film Festival, the Sue and Leonard Miller Center for Contemporary Judaic Studies at the University of Miami, the George Feldenkrais Program, the Holocaust Memorial Greater Miami Jewish Federation, and my very own Holocaust Teacher Institute at the University of Miami. I am honored on behalf of my partners to be introducing and moderating this discussion on the beautiful film, Shores of Light, with our outstanding guests, Dr. Michael Berenbaum, Holocaust scholar, historian, author, and film producer of numerous Holocaust-related films, and the founding project director of the United States Holocaust Museum. Dr. Berenbaum is with us today from California. The next person I want to introduce you to is Yael Katzir. Yael is the award-winning film producer of no numerous films and the executive producer of today's film, Shores of Light. Yael is in Israel. Also in Israel is one of the stars of the film, Shuni Lifshitz, who's also a producer of the film. And as we say in America, a 2G or second generation daughter of Holocaust survivors and a professional translator as well. Let's begin the conversation. I'm going to start with asking a question to Yael, who is the producer director of this film. Then I'm going to go over to Dr. Berenbaum, who I shall refer to as Michael, since he is a colleague and a friend of mine for over 30 years. And then I will go back to Shuni, and then we will just have a discussion after that. Yael, this is a beautiful film about refugee survivors after the Holocaust who could not go to Israel and had nowhere to go, so they went to Italy. Tell us, what inspired you to make this film and tell us how it is that Italy was open to these refugees and how they got there from the DP camps and other places. More important in that question is what inspired you? I'm not sure, but I think that Yael got a little bit frozen on the screen. So instead of waiting for her to come back on, I'm going to quickly go over then to Michael and you could answer the second half of that question. How was it that Italy was open to these refugees and how did they get there from the DP camps and other places in Europe? Well, let, let's begin by, uh, Yael is now on, so well, the question. Uh, unfortunately, uh, our uh, oh. internet has some problems today. I don't... Okay, Yael, if you can answer, I'd appreciate it. I'm sorry, this is the, so, this is the uh, internet uh, life today. I know that, I watch CNN and it even happens there. But if you can answer, I'd appreciate it. What inspired uh, you to do the film? The, can you repeat the question, but very briefly, very concisely, so that I will be able to, with, to answer. Okay. What was okay. your answer? What made me make this film? Yes. yes. Okay. So actually, I, I was not thinking of doing this film before Shuni who, works with, who worked with me together in the same college, in Bet Berl Academic College, came to me and said, Yael, I've been to the place where I was born, and you must do a film about it. 
So I was just, uh, you know, uh, I was in charge at that time of the... Okay, so maybe Michael would like best to do skip over to Shuni, who can tell us... That's okay. And uh, we, we sat on this project and I think that this project enriched me so much that uh, I have discovered through the research, you know, I am historian by profession, and I've discovered through the uh, preparation of the film, the resilience of our people and how powerful our people is. Uh, and uh, it, it is not something uh, that anyone can uh, look down at because it is something very great and very unique. And in spite of everything that is happening in today's world with the COVID-19, with the uh, unfunctioning governments and uh, a lot of other things that I wouldn't want to elaborate on at that point, I want to say that the resilience of the people who survived the Holocaust to to rebuild a new life, to create new families, and to have newborn babies like Sunni. Thank you, yeah. Uh, let me skip over now to Michael. The and, film, and uh, we, and we worked on the film how, how many years, Sunni? Four years, three years? Three years. Okay. About uh, yeah. the three or four years we worked. Yeah. In, uh, uh, yeah, Al, I'm going to skip over to Michael now and ask him the historical question right now, okay? So, mm -hmm. Michael, would you tell us how it was that over 30,000 Jewish refugees from the camps and the ghettos ended up going to Italy? Why did they go there? And how was it that they knew to go there, and who helped them get there? Well, let's let's go let's go backwards. Um, Italy has had a uh, a long Jewish community. The easiest way to say it is Jews were in Italy before Jesus was born, and consequently, the Jewish community, for example, of Rome, precedes Christianity, and precedes the Vatican, not by decades but by centuries. The other thing about it is Italy uh, was an example of fascism without a great deal of anti-Semitism. And the murder of the Jews that occurred in Italy, and remember only about 5,000 or 40,000 uh, Italian Jews were killed. The murder occurred after 1943 when Mussolini was installed, reinstalled after the overthrow. Mussolini, he was reinstalled uh, as head of a puppet government, and then the Germans um, pressured to murder the Jews, they deported the Jews, etc. Italy uh, itself, um, remember Miriam, this was a displaced persons camp. Didn't look like a displaced persons camp, didn't feel like a displaced person camp, because Italy itself was occupied, it was occupied by the Allies, and the Allies took over villas and homes and large areas and uh, made them available for displaced persons. And I wanna pick up on Yael's very important point, which this was um, the single most magnificent part of all of this is Sunni's, uh, is, is, uh, Shuni's birth and the birth of all these kids. People came out of the camps and their response to death was to recreate life. They were young. They wanted to make up for lost time. They had a certain sense of vitality and the desire to live life with its intensity. And they did something which was extraordinarily daring without knowing where their future would be, what the world was gonna be like, they brought children into the world. Bringing children into the world is one of the greatest acts of hope for the future that one can imagine. They brought children into the world and there's a very peculiar thing that we have to pay attention to, which picks, on Yael's, um, picks up on Yael's theme. 
when boys were born and we saw this, they were circumcised. Now that ordinarily is something that happens in every Jewish family when a boy is born. But think of this. For six years, if a man was asked to lower his trousers, was ordered to lower his trousers, it was a sentence of death. Mm -hmm. In the seventh year, without knowing what the world would be, they made an indelible mark on their sons and on their children that would forever transform them, which meant that they not only wanted to bring life into the world, but they wanted to bring Jewish life into the world. In essence, um, as an act of revolt against the death that they had seen, as defiance of the final solution, because they were the first rebirth. And then as uh, Yael said so beautifully, as a sign of the resilience of the Jewish people. After death, they gave birth to life. Thank you so much, Michael. I will come back to you, but thank you for giving us that bit of historical context. Let's go to Shuni. Shuni, tell us more than the film about your earliest moment of discovery as to how you discovered that you were even connected to this story and how it came about that you made this journey back happen with the other two women. Okay. Um, I was, I, all my life I knew that I was born in Italy in a place called Santa Maria di Leuca, but that's all I knew. Uh, I didn't know that I was part of a story. Um, I knew uh, all about the resilience of the Jewish people and because my parents themselves uh, built uh, new families and most of the friends were uh, Holocaust, Holocaust survivors. So I, I grew up in an environment of uh, Holocaust su survivors who rebuilt their life and uh, of uh, second generation children. So it wasn't a uh, surprise for me. And, but I knew, I knew I was born there, but I didn't know anything more about that. Um, by chance, um, I, had a, I, I had a cousin, Israeli cousin who lived in, uh, Ita in Italy. She, she was married to an Italian. And uh, one time when I was visiting her, she discovered, uh, she didn't know, that fact, because when I came to Israel, I was only two months old, so it wasn't an issue at all. Uh, so she discovered that uh, I was born uh, in that place, and we decided to go and visit the place. So in 2009, I went with her, as, as I didn't speak a word of Italian by then. Uh, so we went together, and um, I was amazed to see First of all, the beautiful, beautiful place. It's, it's really, uh, the weather was magnificent and the, the sea and the, the town and everything was so beautiful. And then we met people that um, we found out that they know about this story, that they try to record it by uh, books, we met a person who wrote a book and another person who just wrote a book and wasn't published yet, but it was on his computer already. And um, people who, who knew these stories and could, uh, and they told me, I, b before that, I, I was sure that I was the only one, the only baby who was born in Santa Maria de Leuca. I didn't know that uh, it was a DP camp or that, that, that other people, my parents, on their way to Palestine, stopped in Italy, and I was born there. This is also what I knew, at least what I thought. So uh, when I came, when I first came there, and was amazed, and uh, really by the by the uh, by the people, their warmth, everybody wanted to meet us and tell us the story, and uh, and the landscape and everything was so overwhelming for me. 
and that I said, we must do a document, make a documentary about that, that story because if I don't know, I was born there and I didn't know anything about it. So uh, I presume that the rest of the world doesn't know about it and uh, they should. So on that point, when I returned uh, to Israel, I called Yael, whom I knew before we, uh, for many years. And I told her, uh, I have a story for you for a documentary. So she said, Okay, start when I when I retire. First, I'll do it when I retire. And second, I'll start to make a research. So I did. And uh, um, during the time, uh, by the research, I, I met with the other two women, actually Estelle, the, the one of the three, uh, I've been working with her also in the same college with Yael for many years, but we didn't know that we were born in the same place. By chance, I saw in a document that she was born in Italy in 1946. So I asked her, where in Italy? She said, in a small town. I said, what town? She said, Santa Maria Villarupa. And after two months, she herself was, uh, in a, uh, she's an, an anthropolo anthropologist and she was in Oxford in England and she, in, in a dinner, she met uh, Rivka, she, she didn't know her before, and they started to talk. And uh, it appeared that uh, Rivka also was born in Santa Maria di Luca. So we decided to go on this project uh, together, all three of us. And uh, from that, from then, uh, we already located, actually people um, uh, approached us. We have now 120, babies who were there, born there uh, out of um, 350, about 350 who were born there by that time between 1940, the end of 1944 and 1947. Thank you. That's my story. <laughs> well, I'm going to come back to you. Um, Michael Birnbaum has a question in the chat that he wants to answer. The question is um, from Judy Lameth. I'm a survivor of an Italian internment camp. Would be pleased to provide you honest information, such as why Jews chose Italy. And Michael, do you want to discuss that? Yeah, uh, uh, let me answer Judy's uh, question. Uh, in one sense, you could say Jews chose Italy, but they really didn't have much of a choice. Jews spread out to wherever they could find a place to go. The, um, there was an organization called Bricha, which is escape. And it was essentially uh, by, and I'm using this historically, by Palestinian Jews. And remember that uh, before the state of Israel, the Jews were called Palestinians. So there's no political connotation, but I'm a historian. This is a historical statement. They, it was uh, done by Palestinian Jews who had uh, served in allied forces and who also were sent over. And they developed a series of escape routes uh, in which they hoped to bring Jews ultimately then to Palestine, which was closed by Great Britain, uh, by uh, Britain. And consequently, uh, some of them went to France, some of them went to Italy and uh, those who went to Italy had an easier time than, for example, those who remained in Germany, because those who remained in Germany had the um, horrific experience of living among their perpetrators, living among people who wanted to kill them before, living in a hostile community. And uh, the Italians and the Jews themselves um, I joke that the Italians and Jews have the same ethnicity. Uh, the most important room in the house is the kitchen. The father believes that he is the head of the family and the mother is actually totally in charge. The father decides on uh, foreign policy, on world economic policy, and the mother decides on all the unimportant questions, how the kids will be raised, what the family is going to spend money on, uh, where kids are going to go to school, and all such unimportant questions that don't, don't impact the family whatsoever. 
Thank you. Judy also makes two comments I want to note. One is that she remembers my late brother, Ted Klein. Thank you so much for mentioning that. And she also comments that her husband, Enrico, is with her. And he was in Italy during the war. He was interned there. And after the war, lived in Naples. And interestingly enough, he knew absolutely nothing about the DP camps, which I want to make a comment as an educator that um, I also, in all my research and history and the work I've done with you, Michael, and at Yad Vashem and everywhere, uh, never really knew this story about the 35,000 refugees that went to Italy and about the children that were born there, like Shuni. And so for me, this is also a fascinating new subject. One more question, Michael. In the movie, there's um, reference to the Jewish Brigade. Would you explain to the audience who the Jewish Brigade were? Jewish Brigade were Palestinian Jews who served in the British Army. And they, during the war, they fought as um, enemies of Nazism with great bravery against the Nazis, with the idea that they had a, they, they were not only, remember that Palestine in those era was a British, was under the British mandate. So they were fighting for Britain against Nazism. And after the war, they followed Ben-Gurion's dictum from the 1939 white paper uh, when Britain opposed um, uh, immig Jewish immigration, put a limit on Jewish immigration to Palestine to 15,000 uh, a year for five years, essentially starving the Jews of a place of refuge during the war. Ben-Gurion made a very brilliant decision, which is that um, he said, we shall fight for Britain against Germany as if there were no white paper, and we shall fight for the right to immigrate to the land of Israel against Britain as if there was no Germany. After the war, these uh, Jewish um, uh, soldiers began to act as if they had a second mission which was an all important mission to save and to rescue the Jews. They were joined by American GIs, most especially Jewish GIs and American chaplains. And they took on a second major and important role, which was to help save Jews. And in each of the passages from Eastern Europe to the West, there was an underground uh, operation usually using bribery, but very careful not to use illegal bribery. They used to give out um, material that was worth 10 or 20 times its value in the black market. So they used Hershey bars, cigarettes, condoms, and nylons as a means of bribing to get uh, people who were guarding the border not to pay attention to who was coming over. And these Jews were taken out of Eastern Europe and moved into displaced persons camps. Truman gave an informal approval of use, opening American lines uh, to people fleeing from uh, survivors who were fleeing Nazism uh, and who were fleeing also rising communism, most especially in Poland. And consequently, that's how these people arrived. They arrived in Italy. Uh, Italy had a proximity to the sea, the Mediterranean Sea, the capacity to ultimately go into Palestine, then Israel. And consequently, it was a desired location. And, uh, you know, they had a slum with uh, a view of the Mediterranean Sea and beautiful weather and excellent um, Italian food and real hospitality on the part of the uh, on the part of the Italian people. You will not hear people Jews who were interned in German displaced persons camps mm. have anything of the same comparable feeling of their neighbors because they understood in a very deep way that one year before, 
those neighbors would have betrayed them and would have been involved in killing them. And any man who was of, um, of um, army age, who could have been in the SS or could have been in the Wehrmacht, you looked on as a killer. Thank you. Um, one of the questions, Shuni, I would like to go back to Yael, but I keep losing her. One yes, of the she, questions, Shuni, um, uh, one of the questions, Shuni, for you in the chat is this Naomi says, this is a fascinating documentary, a true gem. I would like to ask Shuni, what was the most surprising thing you learned along your journey and about yourself by returning to the place you were born? Okay, so first of all, uh, the people, the meeting with the people, the, I, I didn't expect anyone to know the story uh, there in, in this place. I, I went mostly uh, to see the place and hope maybe I'll meet one person who may remember and uh, can tell me any, something about, uh, about it. So the, the first surprise was a meeting with people who, as I said before, who were recording it and who could, who, who could show me the places. Uh, this will, villa it shows in the film. Uh, the, in this villa, uh, there was uh, um, uh, this was the pharmacy, and the other one was uh, the uh, dining room, and uh, so on, and also the hospital, the uh, the, the building which is uh, in ruins now, but still, I saw the hospital, so I didn't expect that at all. Yeah. Uh, um, what was the other question? Uh, she wanted to know what you learned about yourself uh, that changed you. I know there's one comment you make in the film relevant to that question. And as a child survivor myself, I can relate to it. You said that the uh, trauma of your parents' experience continues to be a burden. Yeah. And, and I think all of us who were children of survivors, we carry that trauma of their experience and what they had to go through in our lives, in our, in our DNA. Well, this is uh, something that I carry with me. I've been carrying with me all my life. It didn't uh, come up uh, on that visit to, to Italy. It did come up, um, I don't know, maybe 30 years ago uh, in a seminar of uh, second generation, uh, um, it, it, there was a conference of second generation uh, people and uh, we had workshops there. And I think only then I could define for myself this feeling of uh, carrying this trauma on me. Um, but th this didn't happen in Italy. This happened a lot. Um, let, yes. me add, let me add a comment to that, Miriam. That, okay. Uh, yeah, what, we're what, coming to you. We I, haven't I want, I, about you. Go yeah, ahead. I want, to, I want to say something. Okay. That for Please. me, for me as, an, uh, as a Sabra and the second generation Sabra, although my father escaped from the Nazis, uh, what I, what I have experienced most of everything is the fact that the, all the people that uh, were, who, who were born in Santa Maria di Leuca have become one connected family. And by now we have about 110 or 115 people who, ident who are identified, Chuni keeps track of all of them. And for me, this was something really incredible because I was so lucky to grow up in Israel with a big family, Zionistic family who came here from, uh, from the very beginning, 1906, they were already here. We were singing all the Zionistic songs. And then all of a sudden I realized that I am very lucky. <laughs> 
we keep it's where it comes from her, families she... that are split. At least in my generation, today it is a little bit different. But uh, in my generation... Michael, you want to come in on that? Until I, we I, get want, to... I want to come in on, on, on the most interesting, and, and I say this as one who is not a second generation. My uh, grandparents came to America in the 1910s with the great migration from 1881 to 1920. And that was the best thing they ever did for me. And every time I come back from Eastern Europe, which is very often, I express gratitude to my grandparents for having left, left early. Otherwise my parents uh, would have gone through the Holocaust. I would never have been born. Having said that, what Suni, uh, Shuni said, which is true, is that until they were called into a community by shared experience, everybody thought, everybody of the second generation thought that their experience was only private. Mm -hmm. And only when they came together did they realize that there were certain patterns of experience that was unique to their moment in history and their situation, their circumstance in Jewish history. In the United States, it occurred with the writing of Helen Epstein's now classic Children of Survivors. And that called it into being. And when Shuni said that it was only when they broke into workshops that they understood because everybody's experience of, of parents is a personal experience unique to their themselves. Nobody else, uh, brothers and sisters have the same parents, but nobody else has the same parents and the same experience. And when you come into community, you realize the patterns that are there. Uh, and that's, that's the moment that happened for Shuni. And we should recognize that because that's the moment that happened for almost all of the two Gs. Thank you for that comment. I I think that um, I think the 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 most difficult part for two Gs and child survivors that were very young, like myself, is we love our parents so much that to even fathom or think of the pain that they went through is too painful for us. I have a brother who was born in America. And he doesn't want to have anything to do with the subject because of that, because he can't tolerate the knowledge that his parents had to go through what they went through. So that's a very important subject that we will have to explore more. Uh, Shuni, you know, there were moments in that film that I just loved. And yeah, El, you did such a beautiful job capturing I don't know if Michael felt the same way, but when the local um, man who wasn't Jewish remembered singing the Shabbat, Shalom, is that what he was is singing? I, I just sat here and I had tears in my eyes. I thought, how beautiful that 75 years later. So could you tell us about meeting the locals that remembered a little bit more. I thought he was just wonderful. Yeah, Al, do you want to share with us how you felt about that? Well, exactly as you as you described it. I mean, it. Your internet's off again. Uh, we'll come back to you, Shuni. Tell us the moment that you heard him singing that song. Well, it was so. Um... How can I say it? Um, it was uplift, uplifting on the one hand. I was, we, we all were so, so moved. It was a very moving uh, uh, moment. And after that, uh, after we uh, stopped uh, shooting, he said, please give my regards and love to all the people in Israel. <laughs> it was really something I mean I, I don't even have words it was very surprising first of all if you want uh, another surprise that that was uh, a real surprise 
and uh, very moving. Very, very moving. Let's also say a couple of things about it. Um, remember, the stories of survivors returning to Eastern Europe are very different of children of survivors. These are people who are, um, A, they're not meeting with people who are descendants of perpetrators. B, they're not there to reclaim anything. They're merely to discover their own past. So it's not like you go back, you went back to a place in which you were born, but you weren't contemplating making a claim for the villa. No. You, you, weren't, you weren't saying it was yours, and consequently, the townspeople, especially the old townspeople, can remember that. They can remember also the incredible vitality these people had who were trying to recreate and rejoin rejoin life. They were young, they were handsome, they were beautiful, they were vital, they were vibrant, they were loud, and they they were uh, at what in one sense, having faced death in the way that they had faced death, they were unafraid of whatever circumstances were greeting them in in, in Italy because this was comfortable and yeah. safe, secure. Yeah, and also I, I, would, to, I would like, okay. No, go ahead, Shani. I would like to comment on something that you said before uh, about eating uh, good Italian food. They didn't eat good Italian food. The opposite was uh, the case because the Italians themselves, themselves were very, very poor. They had very little food and uh, the Jews were fed by uh, the joint and UNRWA and uh, actually, and, and, and uh, some people say it in the film, uh, they, they, were, they gave uh, the local people from their food. So um, I don't think anybody ate uh, then Italian food, but vice versa, and the, the uh, locals got food from uh, the Jews from Uran. Um, I wanted to ask you a question that's a little bit difficult. But Michael and I have been working on a book about uh, love in the Holocaust and couples that married uh, because they met in the ghettos or in the camps. And we found that most of those couples stayed married 50, 60 years later. Do you know about the couples that married in Italy at that time, whether did you is there any follow up as to whether most of those couples stayed together? Because sometimes the circumstances are what bonds people, the neediness, the neediness to be together, to have a partner to love, and then things change. Any information on that? Whom do you ask? Uh, either one, you or Aria L. I don't, I really don't know. I have no idea if they stay together or not. Mm -hmm. uh, they married because I, I think that the common denominator that people who were survivors were so strong that mm -hmm. I don't believe they could marry with someone else. But to say that they were loyal all the way down, who knows? I don't know. And did they stay in Italy? Did any couples eventually go back and live there, uh, went to Israel Italy? and then went back? In Italy, no, no. Most of the people who were in Italy wanted to go to Israel, but not all of them were able to because it was an illegal uh, migration. And, uh, and, uh, and, and Miriam, remember one other thing. These were not people who had roots in Italy. The what? They did not have roots in Italy. Oh, yeah, yeah. In other words, in, in other words their, their roots were elsewhere. So if you dream of okay. going home, uh, even though there were no homes to return to, it's a dream of going to Hungary, Poland, to, yeah. uh, you know, uh, et cetera. They're not rooted in Italy. They are in Italy. And being together, there was also a collective yearning for Palestine, for Israel. Yeah. 
which was reinforced by the education, by the songs, by the Hebrew teaching uh, and the like. This is where the Jewish Brigade and, uh, and the like came in and where the uh, Jewish agency came in, bringing all sorts of, of um, skill building for these people in order to do it. Let me touch on one other thing Yael uh, said, which is why marriage? And one of the reasons that marriage was very important uh, was these were people who had lost families, exactly. who had no one else in the world, very often had even lost previous families, wives and children. And consequently, the possibility of being close to someone and loving someone or having someone to care for. And then the other reason that children were brought into the world was both a hope for the future, but also finally you had something precious and new whom you loved and whom you could and whom would give you love. Absolutely. And any of us who have held a little baby in our arms know what a recommitment to life and vitality and vibrancy and joy that is. Uh, and consequently for survivors, this was being able to touch innocence in a way they could never again touch innocence. A beautifully stated as always. I was particularly touched also that there were 120 orphans. I mean, can you imagine being a child with no parents left, taken to there, to Italy? Uh, did you in your research or in your filming find out uh, who counseled them, who, who helped them? And how young do you think the youngest of the orphans were? Does anybody know anything about that? Yeah, El, Juni? The, the orphans were collected by all kinds of uh, Jewish organizations. Uh -huh. Well, they either organizations that were formed in the communities uh, in Eastern Europe, or they were taken by the Jewish Brigade soldiers and they were brought together. And then when they were brought to Israel, most of them were sent to Kibbutzim. Uh, today and also in the 50s. <laughs> well, when when you can Yael, Yael, can we suggest you turn off your camera, which will therefore use much less internet, and at least give us your voice? A Jewish state, but not a religion. Yes. And let me say, the reason they were sent to Kibbutzim is, especially in that era, Kibbutzim were oriented into communities of young people. No. So they didn't feel the absence of parents in the same way that in our isolated world in which we then at the end of the day, go back from school to our home, to our parents, to our street, uh, and are again in the nuclear family, an orphan feels he, has no, he or she has no place to go. But in the kibbutz where they sleep together, they eat together, they learn together, they work together, you feel less isolated uh, and much more capable of, of much more in a sense of community, finding the ties that bring you up, they bring each other up in a very real sense. Thank you so much. Uh, before we go to the questions as we near the end of this wonderful hour, um, I love the part near the end, of course, being an educator, when you went to speak to the local teenagers to see what they knew about this history. Uh, tell us about that day that was so beautiful. Uh, either Yael or Shuni. Shuni, you wanna go first? Yeah, okay. Okay, uh, it was really, again, another surprise, but uh, not on my first visit there, but wh while we were making the film, uh, we, got, we, had, uh, we got con, uh, uh, connected to uh, this uh, uh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Yeah, I don't know who's, uh, we have a sub conversation going on. Go ahead, Shuni. Um, uh, so it was really a surprise to learn that these, these uh, children, these young people go to Auschwitz and learn about the Holocaust. And it was again, a real surprise, but I have to say that uh, and tell you that uh, in Italy, uh, all the weeks around the uh, uh, International Holocaust uh, uh, Memorial Day, uh, they have programs all over in schools, in uh, television, uh, uh, in the theater, all over. They have many, many programs uh, learning about that. And since we made the film, uh, we're always invited uh, to um, this area of Salento where the uh, DP camps were to talk uh, with, uh, they show them the film and we are invited to talk uh, with the children, uh, tell them our story and answer questions and so on. And now this uh, year it was on Zoom and I met with, I think, I don't know, maybe 20 classes um, on Zoom, who saw not, not the whole film, but the uh, trailer, and um, I told them. That was a very beautiful, exciting day. Yael, that was a beautiful day that you filmed. Were there a lot of surprises that you didn't expect that happened that day, well, the last day? Yeah, of course there were surprises. There were every day there were there were surprises, and I think that what touched me most was the fact that I could get much closer to my own friends, and a lot of things that I didn't know before or I didn't realize before, to be more precise, I could uh, re uh, I could realize when on this last day and uh, I think it was a very uh, good idea to finish the film with a celebration in the museum when the other children came and it was very very really it was indeed very moving. The next film that we did was also connected to Puglia and it is about the saving of a thousand of Jews in Albania, Jewish refugees. And because about 6,000 of them were moved uh, by Italian permission to these uh, camps in Southern Italy. And uh, this is how I, I who actually vowed that I will never do a Holocaust movie. I will do only things with optimism, with hope, with uh, et cetera. I couldn't, I couldn't resist the need to, to go to Albania and for another three years, Juni came with me and we did very thorough research also there and to discover that a state that is mostly Muslim saved so many Jews, it was also very uh, enlight enlightening. Let me, let me add two historical points. Um, the first is Albania was the only country in Europe that had more Jews at the end of the war than it did at the beginning. Yeah, this it, is right. it, wasn't, it wasn't a massive number, but it was not an insignificant number. The second is they had a principle called BESA, B-E-S-A, mm -hmm. which was their principle that they had given their word of universal respect and they kept it. And I worked on a museum in Macedonia which is a neighboring country to Albania. And one of the people who told the story said his father um, escaped to Albania, uh, pretended to be a Muslim doctor uh, and everybody knew he was a Jew and nobody turned him in and nobody uh, did, any, did anything else. And his memories of childhood in Albania were absolutely fabulous. And he couldn't get over the fact that Albania then was closed for so many years to Western to Western influence. But Yael said something to us in, in before that I want to um, underscore. Yael said um, 
uh, said that this was not a Holocaust film. This was a post-Holocaust film. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's a very important uh, distinction. The Holocaust is the shadow, it's the backstory, but the front story is going forward and pushing on. And that's what gives us all when we see this film, such an, uh, you know, I, I said to my wife, whom you can imagine is a little bit saturated with Holocaust films and has to at least see the films that I make uh, in addition to everything else. Uh, and also the filmmakers who come, I said, this is a Holocaust, uh, a Holocaust film that's going to make you I'm smile all sure. the way through. And Yael uh, uh, said rightfully that it's not. And it really, and I want you to touch on it, Yael. What does this tell us about who we, these crazy Jewish people are? <laughs> yeah, Al. Okay, so I'm sure she's dying to answer that, but she's frozen for the moment. Uh, until we get her back, um, how about if we go to chat? There's some questions in there. Yeah, Al, are you back with us? I'm so sorry about the internet. It's really coming and going. It, it innovates me a lot. <laughs> well, you're all the way in Israel. We're so happy to have you because this no, film was just wonderful. We loved it. And whatever we have to put up with, we can put up with. Yeah, um, let, let, me, let me ask you the question while we have you quickly. What does this tell you about the resilience, the vitality of the Jewish people, the crazy people we're part of? <laughs> well, I want to tell you, my father was a gynecologist who escaped from Hitler, and he managed to escape very early. And until I was involved in doing this film, I didn't realize the meaning of giving bells under all this heavy uh, load of uh, memories of loss, of pain, and grieving. And I think this is the resilience of the Jewish people to go on, to continue in spite of everything. And uh, I, I can only respect and cherish all these people. And I know how much people who came to my father wanted a child and what they were ready to do in order to have a child. But to have a child after a war without the family and only with the husband, it was very courageous in my opinion. Really very courageous. And this is resilience in my opinion. By the way, this, this continued dramatically in Israel. I, I belong to the generation of the 67 war. And it mm -hmm. was remarkable to me how many um, Israelis I know response after 67, after the destruction, um, came back and had another child. Uh, many of them ironically hoped for a girl this time. And you said this also, Suni. Uh, they hoped for a girl because a boy was much more in danger of going into combat and dying, but a girl was somehow safe and safe. Not anymore, not anymore. Not anymore. Girls, now, we have, now we have equality. But Sunni more, responded, we have more, more equality. Uh, less, in, less, equality. less inequality. Yeah, that's true. Cool. But Sunni, it's more equality. Did I say, I, I said what? Sorry. About being a girl. Your parents, your, somebody said that they were, that uh, their mother wanted um, a girl because the girl would not have to be circumcised and consequently um, uh, would, not be, would not be in the same danger as a boy. <laughs> not me, but... Uh... Well, I think Let, that... let me tell you, my cousin fought in Nitzanin and she was the only mother who was there with the communication system and she was killed by the Egyptians. And uh, I think that also in the war of independence, there were enough women who were fighting. And today, women are fighting for their right to be in the fighting unit. Unfortunately, the religious people uh, tried to block it. 
but so far they've made very nicely. I did a film, uh, Company Jasmine, about the, these kind of women. And uh, I followed them for three years. And I myself was an officer and, uh, but you are right that women are still not as uh, equal in the army, which is the most uh, mainly uh, closed club. Uh, let me, let me um, uh, answer one other question, uh, which is an interesting Miami connection. There was a rabbi in Miami by the name of Rabbi Abramowitz, who was mm -hmm. a well-known rabbi in Miami, who was in the Italian sector uh, after the liberation, and who worked with all of these Italian displaced persons camps. And he worked as an American chaplain, and remember American chaplains were officers and they spent a good deal of their effort, but they also were Jews, they also were rabbis, and they spent a good deal of their effort trying to commandeer the resources of the American army to help the survivors. And one of the great stories uh, that, that uh, should be acknowledged is the rabbi in uh, Miami, Rabbi Bromwitz, who only died a couple of years ago in his late 90s. Uh, and the role that he the role that he played, the American chaplains, like the Jewish Brigade, felt that they had a double mission. One is a mission as soldiers, the other was a mission as Jews, and the third um, for rabbis was also a mission as rabbis. And one of the nice things to see, for example, is the way in which and and you didn't touch on it but the way in which that generation celebrated their first Seder and freedom, which is yeah. our, pa our Passover festival that is the festival of freedom. And one of the great things the joint did was an incredible um, Seder plate, which said, Me'avdut um, from slavery onto freedom and L'shana Hazot B'Yerushalayim, not next year, in Jerusalem, but this year in Jerusalem. And on the back, it had stamped the wow. the product of the remnant that survived in exile in Germany. And if there ever was a definition of exile, you have to imagine what it means to be in exile in 1945 and 46 in Germany. And your experience in Italy was very different because you weren't living, uh, your parents were not living among your killers. They were living in a community in, from which Jews were not deported and in which Jews Absolutely. lived. And that gave, uh, again, another touch to the entire experience. Last question from my point. Yael, has this been shown on Italian television? Yeah, it was on Italian television. We have uh, versions in Italian, in French, in Spanish, in German, we don't have a version, and in English, of course, with English wow. subtitles. I mean, all these versions are with English subtitles. And what was the response in Italy when it was shown on television? I don't, I'm not sure, uh, my, my co-producer, co he, he, he has very deep roots in Italy. He comes from a rabbi's family and he is a kibbutz member. And he took care of all the Italian connection, but it was on Italian television, yeah. It was also on Israeli television, on Yom HaShoah. Please know that I love this film. I first saw it. Uh, through the Sousa Mendes Foundation. I work closely with Olivia and I fell in love with it. And I asked our uh, Jewish film festival director here in Miami to please show it for my screening the Holocaust series, which I found it five years ago. So I hope I've made new friends with you and that when I come back to Israel, maybe next summer, I can look you up and we can all go out and have a coffee at one of your wonderful cafes. So with that, I thank you, my friend, Michael, for always being brilliant and joining the group. And, and thank you, this was a terrific film. 
<laughs> Thank you for waking up so early in, uh, in LA. And yeah, Alan Shuni, Lehi Tirod, Baracha. I hope we meet again personally soon. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you.